Competitiveness, is it a buzzword? Can it be a buzzword? Well, first of all, make no mistake, it is about competition. That's why it's called competitiveness, after all. And why don't people like competition? Probably there are many reasons, but I think there are two. And this is my amateur historian coming into play. Well, first of all, the phrase by Darwin, survival of the strongest, is a wrong translation. Darwin never said survival of the strongest. He never implied that the strong brutes who can, I don't know, just overpower other person by physical strength are the ones who survive. The actual phrase is survival of the fittest, and the phrase is like this long. So the, what survival of the fittest means is, well, it can be survival of the smartest, survival of the one who fits the situation best, survival of the, of the, of the organism uh, which is best suited for the situation. So that's one thing. Imagine how different thinking about economics competition and society would be if that phrase would be translated into our language as not the survival of the strongest, but the survival of the smartest. I bet generations of people would actually be more liberal than they are. So that's one amateurish uh, sort of insight. Another one is that for a long time, if you look at historically, survival was a very nasty affair. For a very long time of human, human history, there was no productivity growth, there was no technology, the only way to eat more food was to take over your neighbor's land. That was the only way to prosperity. It was a zero-sum game. If you ate more, your neighbor ate less. So obviously, throughout our tradition, religion, culture, this disdain for richness or disdain for good living comes from these, I would say, dark times, and I hope they will never return, then if one person was rich, that was exactly at the expense of another person. So basically, the, the socialist maxim that the rich are the product of the poor, or that the rich are there because there are poor people, comes from these times. And I hope these times uh, will never return. So those are my two sort of thoughts why people don't like competition. What does it, or competitiveness, what does it mean? And I do not claim to be the sort of, to so have a novel of explanation what competitiveness means. Many people have their in, own interpretations. But uh, I think we need some criteria. And I think we can sort of put out two criteria. Uh, so basically, it's attractiveness or how easy it is or how, how many businesses want to do business in your country. And the second of all is how resilient is your economy to external shocks. Well, let's start with the second one, or the so-called resiliency argument. Uh, the reason why I chose a palm tree for this illustration is uh, what it means is the trees, they bend in the wind. So if situation changes, instead of trying to ignore the world, the economy should change likewise. I think that the policy response of some countries to the crisis is like to stash a lot of money and then to spend that money during the crisis is a wrong kind of policy. So the good or the resilient economy is the one that is able to adapt. I mean, take a look at the last financial crisis. Uh, many countries chose many different responses. And crisis will happen. Uh, that is inevitable. The only people not affected by the financial crisis was probably some isolated tribe living in the Amazonian forest. They were not affected by subprime mortgages. They do not know what mortgage is. But I don't think this is the path any of us want to take our countries to. So if we want to be part of the modern world, crisis will happen. Which means from time to time, we will have to change the way we live. People will lose jobs, businesses will go bankrupt, assets, assets will be destroyed. And that has to happen from time to time. Because only from that, new businesses can arrive, uh, new factories can be opened, and people who can learn new skills and start, a new th start new things. That's why it's called structural adjustment. The economy changes as such. So the faster your economy can adapt, I think the more resilient it is, uh, the more likely it is to, to, to come out on top during the crisis. And I'll talk more about that later. Second point is how attractive is your country to businesses. And make no mistake, competitiveness is not like a beauty pageant where the country stand and pretend to be nice. Uh, it's not some sort of competition where everyone is a winner. No, you either, you, businesses either want to do business in your country or they don't. And businesses being rational, they want to earn money. And well, so I'm told that the one way of making money is to find out what people want 
then produce that thing at the price that people want, and then sell that thing to the people who want it. And basically, very, very primitively speaking, if businesses want to do that in your country, you have some degree of competitiveness. Now, no, make one. Uh, whenever we talk about successful countries, sometimes we get confused. So let me make, uh, let me make this distinction. Country can be attractive for business, but it not, may not necessarily be competitive. Well, imagine some sort of stereotypical, uh, politically incorrect African state, rich in resources, which for some companies it is very attractive to do business there. Uh, they don't mind corruption, they don't mind, like, they don't mind lack of human rights or any rights all of it, at all. And those countries might say, well, you know, this country is attractive for business, but that country will not be competitive. So my, my point being, some countries can be attractive uh, with some countries have bad things such as corruption or lack of basic rights and they can be attractive but they are attractive despite these things rather than because of those. It's the same thing when we talk about Scandinavia. It does, it's a very attractive place to do business and it does, have, it, does, it does have high taxes but it is competitive not because of high taxes but despite, despite high taxes. Well, Take another thing, take a look at another thing, what I mean when I talk about competitiveness, and don't mind if you don't get what all these dots are about. What we've done here is we cross-correlated four indices. Two of them, these ones, they measure competitiveness, and that's doing business by World Bank and uh, global competitiveness by World Economic Forum. So basically, this, measures, this, one, this thing measures the competitiveness, and this thing measures economic freedom. So, and since we have four indices all cross-correlated, we have some sort of trend. So the very simple explanation of that is that those countries who are competitive are usually also have a higher degree of economic freedom and vice versa. So many of the measures that increase the country's competitiveness are closely related to the amount of economic freedom that people have in that country. And obviously, I, I, I'm not talking just in theory, of, each of these indices have very specific criteria, what they mean when they say economic freedom. It's not just a mere word. So what, sort of my one advice, uh, if you're looking for a policy solution or policy direction to make your country more competitive, basically make it, uh, make it so that people can work, create and earn money more easily. So that's one point. Second point, if that doesn't convince you about the uh, direction of where, that your, let's say, policy should aim at, look at this thing. Uh, this is a survey of largest relocations of businesses that was done in 2013. Uh, so we're talking greenfield, brownfield, and all these other things, and basically a foreign investor comes to your country and builds something and produces something. Um, and obviously many of those people were polled. What was the reason for your relocation? And the answers are given here. And this paints a very, very interesting picture. Well, first of all, like a doctor usually says, for, for Central and Eastern Europe, we have good news and bad news. So the bad news is that, the, let's say, the two main criteria that, uh, that why people want to relocate or invest in your country is domestic market potential and proximity to markets of customers. Well, as much as I would want to relocate my country as far away from uh, our eastern neighbor, we cannot do that. That is a given. We cannot change our geography. So that's one thing. Second thing, as much as I would like to, and as much as politicians in Lithuania would like to, Lithuania is a, is a country of barely 3 million people. To speak of a huge market is impossible. Our market is tiny, and we cannot change that. So that's a, sort of that's the bad news. The good news is that this thing of, let's say, the business climate, or the rules how you do business is very important. That's actually in the third place. The other good news is that it depends on us. Ease, ease of doing business is very, or competitiveness is very much related to what the governments do, what laws they have, what regulations they have. So all, any government, they cannot do anything about these things. They, no government can change that. Even if they say they can, they still cannot. But this thing, they can. This is within our power. The obstacles to businesses are not natural, they're not geographic, they're not determined, they're usually just pieces of paper with someone's signature on it. 
Changing pieces of paper should be changing pieces of paper, rewriting pieces of paper should be the easy part, right? So that's so my sort of one policy suggestion, especially for us in Central and Eastern Europe, is actually pursue this. This is probably the only advantage we have. A couple of more interesting things as well. Well, look at this. Uh, government support. Usually, local, local politicians uh, in all the countries, they sometimes lament that there is no government support in terms of subsidies. And once again, we could get into a long argument, but it's not that important. It is very costly. And it is a minor factor in deciding when to, when to relocate, at least according to, 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 to this study. Second thing, lower costs. That's usually in our, in our world means either lower taxes or more importantly, lower wages. That's also a very small, uh, let's say, factor, which is good because I don't think any of you or any, or any of your politicians in your country or politicians in my country want to perpetually be a country of cheap labor. We all want to produce expensive products with huge value added and high wages. So the good thing is, first of all, we're getting more expensive as, as a region. Uh, second of all, this thing plays less and less, uh, uh, less and less influence. Now, I'm not saying that it does not have influence. Rem remember that this is a worldwide survey. But my point is, just compare the two. So instead of these things, we should be we should be investing our brains into how to make businesses better. Now, if some of you say, why do we need investment or why do we need FDI? And I hope none of you have this, have this question, but my very simple answer is without investment, education has no point. It's just a waste of money. You can, you can be the best operator of bulldozer or can have a, you can be the best programmer. If you don't have tools to work with, your education is wasted. Uh, because if you're not given tools to work with, you shall not create products. So that's my one point. So this is people, you, we may have a traditionally good education, we may have very well educated people. If these people have no tools to work with, they are doomed to either do nothing or emigrate, which is another waste of money. We invest into people and then, then they leave. So the good thing about investment, whether domestic or international, is actually it gives people tools to work with. The usual example I give in Lithuania is that you have two people, one of them very motivated, very educated, uh, and another one a lazy person. But if a very motivated and educated person works with a shovel and the lazy person works with an excavator, the one with the excavator will create much more value added than the one with the shovel. That is very primitive and simplistic, but that is true. So I think all of sort of the, the long-term growth, competitiveness growth path for our countries is become to have more value added, to become more productive, and that comes not just through education, but it also comes through, through investment. So that's why my one point, why do you want investment? Because people will earn more. And how, how do we do that? Via better business climate. So that's my one point why competitiveness is good. Second point is actually, I like this graph, also don't, uh, don't bother too much uh, reading the fine print, but this is what our friends at Heritage uh, in the United States do. They basically they correlate, once again, the competitiveness or economic freedom and GDP per capita. Once again, we could argue all day whether GDP per capita is a good measure of, uh, of, uh, of wealth, etc., 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 but the, the trend is clear. It is usually the case that countries who are, who are either who, are, who have more economic freedom and competitiveness, they usually are richer. Of course, you could argue that you know, the, the direction is, is, it goes in that another direction, but the, that's a moot point. So the second point is why competitiveness and attractment of foreign investment is good, is that people become richer. Third point, uh, actually, like, let's make this a third point. And we just had a conference about that yesterday. Uh, gray economy or shadow economy, tax evasion, and then people work illegally is a sizable problem in my country, and I bet is also a sizable issue, or at least issue of concern in your country. And this uh, Professor Schneider, whom we cooperate with on this project, has some very interesting data. So basically, long story short, he says there are different factors, of course, that influence people's propensity to move into shadow economy, or basically, you know, the issue is complicated, is what he's saying. And he, he sort of arranged the determinants. 
So yes, morality of people, attitudes of people do matter, right? Whether they are getting good value for, for their money also matters. He says the only, the biggest determinant of whether people want to be in shadow economy or in gray economy is the size of taxes. Once again, it's a complicated topic, but my, my point is low taxes are not just good for business, Low taxes are also good in the sense that it actually keeps people working in the legal economy as opposed to the illegal economy. And I understand that's a complicated issue, but uh, that is also a complicated survey. So my, 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 my point is, whenever someone wants to raise taxes, always keep in mind that people can escape taxation, not just by emigrating, not just by moving, not just by doing some tax optimization, but just moving into the illegal sector. Fourth and final point of my previous slide. Also, this is an illustration of uh, how Lithuania survived the, the, the financial crisis. And also, I'll try to explain it very briefly. Uh, so in 2009, we had a GDP of uh, minus 15%, which was a huge slump. And uh, many people say, well, you guys should be dead by now. And, and what happened was absolutely miraculous. The economy, the private sector restructured basically in a couple of months' time. Many people were laid off. 99.7 people were laid off, quote unquote, voluntarily. What it meant that no one observed the labor code, no one paid attention to the severance payments. People are basically were just told to quit and to sign the paper that I quit of my own will, no compensation of anything. Now, that might sound as a very drastic Darwinian experiment. And in some cases, that was. But what happened, what we measured is how many economic indicators uh, bounced back to the previous long-term trend, and when did that happen? Uh, and the reason we did that, because the court asked us to determine when the financial crisis began in Lithuania, and then did it end. So two, two insights from this. Private sector got back to the previous long-term growth trend, let's in 2013. Uh, Basically, that the, what we could say the crisis in the private sector and the economy was over. What lagged behind was the public sector, which, unlike private sector, did not move fast, did not restructure, and is still experiencing large problems, which are just compounding because there's too large of the public sector, too few people to use the product, and everyone wants to get paid. So, uh, so sort of unsurprisingly, we tripled our external debt in just a couple of years. So, in final points, if to keep just uh, in terms of uh, in, in terms of conference, uh, what are the two practical reforms I would want to share? Is one of them would be a reform of controlling institutions. What the government did in 2009 and finished in 2011, uh, also in a very sort of simplified manner, is that every controlling institution that comes to control a business. Uh, they have a sort of a set of questions written on paper and it is only the questions they can ask the business. In other words, if the inspector, health inspector or, or uh, I don't know, business regulation inspector comes to, comes to your office, you know what he can ask you and he knows what, what he can ask you. So that was one thing to prevent abuse of power by controlling institutions and sort of put them in that framework so they don't pick on silly things and don't extort, extort money. I think that worked somewhat. Somewhat. Second point was the reform of uh, state-owned enterprises. Prior to 2009, no one really exactly knew how many state-owned enterprises we had and what exactly they do. So the one thing that one good thing that the government did is they they did a survey. Uh, they, they did basically a housekeeping inventorization of what the state owns. And uh, right now, it survived a couple of governments. And it's available on the website. It's basically each all the financial results of each state-owned company, what exactly they do, and everything that is available to the public. Uh, of course, we still need to reform more, and these enterprises have to be split from commercial to non-commercial, but the first good thing that no government now dares to touch is this publicity thing. Because even governments don't like to privatize companies, even if they don't like to reform them, they cannot go back and say, we shall not give information anymore. So once again, small thing, but I think it's a step towards a good direction. So, in, in sort of in conclusion, uh, 
competitiveness is important. It's not a bad word. There's nothing wrong with being best in the world. And I hear that you guys are one of the best in terms of productivity per capita. Good. That's exactly what competitiveness uh, should be about. Thank you. Okay.